In the 1890s, the race for the North Pole was in full swing. Swedish engineer Salomon August André set out to be the first person to actually reach it, despite having no significant wilderness or survival experience. Why was he so confident that him and his party could make it? Well, because of his novel mode of transportation, a hydrogen balloon. His proposal was met with much enthusiasm, and in the summer of 1897, winds were favorable enough to launch him and his two party members northwards. However, despite all the optimism and hype, it took only a few hours for Andre to realize that his plan, much like his gas balloon, was full of holes. This is the 1897 Arctic Balloon Expedition. The late 19th century was a different time. Back then, the inhospitable icy desert of the Arctic was seen as a place to be conquered, as a challenge to be overcome. In this race for glory, Sweden had fallen behind, with hardly any significant milestones beyond the Viga expedition of 1878. It was for this reason that the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, as well as the national press, were eager to listen when established engineer André published his plans. He wanted to fly a balloon from the northern island of Svalbard all the way to either Russia or Canada, possibly crossing the North Pole during his journey. The winds would of course have to be favorable, but beyond that, André devised a technique of steering the balloon via sails and drag ropes. These ropes would hang from the balloon and create friction with the ground, thereby allowing a change of course of up to 27 degrees relative to the wind's direction. Or so he claimed because even when his plans were first published, German and French experts were skeptical. After all, André was one of Sweden's first and only balloon enthusiasts and neither did he receive any formal training, nor was he considered to be an actual expert in this field. In fact, he had been working behind a desk at Sweden's patent office for the past few years and flying gas balloons was nothing more than a hobby to him. The only practical experience he had was as a researcher on the Spitsbergen expedition about 10 years prior. Despite all of that, he was granted funding and his first expedition was scheduled for the summer of 1896. The two most essential things he would need now were of course his party and a suitable balloon. Finding the right mates was actually not that difficult as there were many volunteers in search for glory. He ended up choosing Niels Gustav Eckholm, his former superior from the Spitsbergen expedition, who would be responsible for the meteorological research. The other party member would be Niels Strindberg, an expert on photography. He was to carry out the primary objective of the expedition, create a photographic record of the North Pole, from which others could derive maps that would then help in later expeditions. As for the balloon, in the 1890s, Sweden did not yet have the expertise to construct balloons that would meet the requirements, which is why André ordered a state-of-the-art gas balloon from French expert Henri Lanchambray. Fully inflated, the Eagle, as it was named, had a diameter of 20.5 meters and André initially claimed it would be able to stay afloat for a staggering 900 days. That figure, however, was quickly revised by André to just 30 days, and after it was discovered that the balloon lost almost 70 kg of lift each day, Eckholm calculated that it would only be able to stay afloat for a mere 17 days. The exact figure would remain unknown, as the balloon had not once been test flown. All through the summer, it just sat in the hangar on Danes Island, being constantly checked for leaks. To André's disappointment, the attempt in 1896 eventually had to be cancelled because of continuous north wind. Furthermore, Niels Eckholm resigned after he realized how much of the success relied on overly optimistic wind conditions, a balloon that did not meet expectations and the sheer optimism of a single man. The hype surrounding the mission declined and André was put in a tough situation where he felt he had to prove himself against overwhelming odds. And so he tried again in the following summer with a new companion Knut Frankel replacing Niels Eckholm. While Frankel did not have the proven track record as an Arctic explorer and also lacked the meteorological knowledge, he was an avid hiker and easily the most athletic of the three. And as the summer of 1897 came to its peak, the winds finally started to go in their favor, so that on July 11th, 1897, they were finally able to begin their journey.
but they were immediately up to a rough start when the balloon did not take off upwards but crashed into the wall of the hangar. As it slowly cleared the wall and the sails started catching wind, it would begin its northward journey, but unfortunately things went metaphorically south soon after. The balloon began spiraling down towards the beach and, in a panic, our team quickly tried to cut ballast, most of the attached sandbags. At the same time, the drag ropes all started twisting in the same direction, which resulted in two of three ropes detaching. Almost 700 kg lighter, the balloon now quickly rose into the air again, much quicker than anticipated, with hardly any way to steer it. <laughs> but instead of making an emergency landing while they still could, Andre decided to keep on going, to push ahead and make an already risky venture even riskier. With no way to effectively steer the balloon, the crew was now completely at the wind's mercy. And because of the lower weight, the altitude was much too high, which meant that the hydrogen, and thereby the balloon's ability to lift, was escaping faster than anticipated. A lot faster, actually. Despite its already low weight, it took the balloon only 10 hours to touch the ground again, and at this point, Andre and his crew were almost out of ballast to cut. With the wind still carrying them forward, the next 40 hours were spent in what was later described as a bumpy ride, with the balloon touching the ground occasionally and then rising again slightly. Finally, in the morning hours of July 14th, they decided that it was of no use. At 82 degrees and 56 minutes, less than one third of the distance to the North Pole, Andre's expedition was cut short, and the three men landed the balloon on a thick sheet of ice. With their only mode of transportation effectively destroyed, they would have no choice but to walk back. But back to where exactly? At this point, they were more than 450 kilometers from their starting point, and in the back of their minds, they knew that in two months, the Arctic winter would begin. Crossing the North Pole and making it to Canada or Russia was out of the question, and no ship would be able to make the journey to rescue them. The ice would be way too thick. The party probably realized that, one way or another, they would have to spend the winter in the Arctic, probably even on the ever-moving ice sheets above extremely cold water. At some point, Andre used his field glass in hopes of finding something. Land, open water, mountains, really anything. But as we know now, the Arctic consists of mostly ice and hardly anything to protect his party from the elements. A tough spot to spend the winter. Bottom line, they had to move south and they had to do it quickly. On July 22nd, they started their journey towards a depot on Cape Flora, Franz Joseph Land. To bring as much of their gear as possible, they used sleds, but because of that, they weren't able to move more than a few kilometers a day. This was in part because someone insisted on keeping non-essential items such as champagne and books, but also because of ice drift. They had to walk southeast, but the ice was drifting west, and on August 4th, Niels Strindberg realized that for the past few days, they had not made any progress at all. Despite hauling their sleds for more than 10 hours per day, the ice had drifted north faster than they were able to walk south. It was obvious at this point that they would never reach Franz Joseph Land in time, and they decided to change course, heading instead towards the Seven Islands. This would be a journey of approximately 220 kilometers, through much more difficult terrain and against ever-blowing winds. With dwindling morale and being exhausted from the past weeks, the islands would simply not come any closer. Ultimately, they had to resign, as even this target would be out of reach. In their ever-increasing desperation, they built a little ice hut to be at least protected from the elements. And this turned out to be actually a pretty good idea, because not only were they now sheltered, but at some point, the ice flow they were on started drifting south again, ultimately reaching the island of Kvitoya on October 6th. You would think that this might be the turning point of their story, that from here on out they could probably make it. After all, Andre and his companions no longer had to worry about the flimsy ice and cold water beneath it. They would have a greater selection of animals to hunt, and with the topographical features of the island, finding or building proper shelter would likely be easier. But something happened. Something that fueled speculations for years to come. Because you see, up to this point, what we know about the events mostly came from Andre's diary, as well as the photos taken by Strindberg. But from here on out, the final few pages become largely illegible and entries suddenly stop two days later. 
For the longest time, the fate of André's expedition remained unknown, with people speculating endlessly as to what might have happened. It wasn't until the summer of 1930 that the remains of André, Strindberg and Frankel were discovered by the Norwegian Bratwag expedition. And while the ultimate fate of our party was now certain, the exact circumstances surrounding their death will remain a mystery for years to come. There have been numerous theories as to what might have happened. Carbon monoxide poisoning, oxygen depletion in the tent, algae soup poisoning, scurvy, hypothermia, lead poisoning, a gunshot wound, a polar bear attack or even a morphine overdose. For the final part of this video, let's look at some of the more popular theories. Carbon monoxide poisoning. People have suggested that André and his party might have cooked inside the tent with a stove and thereby inadvertently poisoned themselves. That however is rather unlikely, because not only was the stove found outside the tent with some kerosene still inside, but Strindberg actually died slightly before the other two and was subsequently buried. Something as acute as carbon monoxide poisoning or oxygen depletion would have killed all three men at roughly the same time. Another slightly more likely theory would be hypothermia mixed with exhaustion and dehydration. After struggling for weeks to keep themselves warm, it is certainly plausible that the three members of our group were simply at their limits and could no longer withstand the constant cold snowstorms. On the other hand, opponents of this theory often point out that André's diary did not contain many hints of frostbite or a lack of warm or dry clothes. In fact, Strindberg did not even use some of his still dry clothes and shoes. They still had lots of food left and would have been able to boil snow for easy water access. The only item that could indicate dwindling morale would be the morphine that was found in the tent next to Frankel's remains. Now as for the polar bear attack, this theory has recently gotten more popular after it was re-evaluated by Swedish author and doctor Bea Usma. All throughout the diary are instances where our group met these creatures and often showed very little respect for their strength. André even wrote in his diary that he saw some on the island of Quitoya one day before his last entry and it would certainly seem plausible that the food supplies could have attracted them. But the most compelling piece of evidence would be Strindberg's clothes, which shows severe signs of damage that could indicate a fight and subsequent injury from a polar bear. Fellow YouTuber Vext, who also examined this case, imagined the final day as follows. After Strindberg died from a polar bear attack, André and Frankel buried him. Either injured from the fight or simply depressed after seeing his comrade die, Frankel resorted to morphine, to which he ultimately succumbed. When André returned to the tent, he saw that now two of his companions were dead and realized that he was now alone, hundreds of kilometers from home and with little chance of survival. He then left the tent, climbed on a nearby rock and sat there for 33 years. Hey everyone, this is the Oho Signal and thank you for watching my 7th video. This was a collaboration with Vex, so be sure to check out his channel as well. Unfortunately, it always seems to take forever to make these videos, but hopefully I'll be able to change that in 2022. Anyways, uh, thanks for sticking around and see you next time.